All right, how's everybody doing this morning? Pretty good? Hey, thanks. Hey, I love your hair, by the way. It's great to see everybody here this morning, everybody watching online, so glad to be here. If we don't know each other, my name is Adam, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Wiregrass, and man, so excited about these next couple of weeks as we start a brand new series called It's Not All Gravy, Changing Your Perspective of Family, the Holidays, and the Issues in Between <laughs> and Around Those Things, and I'm really I was, before we kind of get into the message this morning, I was reminded of how much I need this message today. Just this morning of just like what we're going to talk about is like the source, the solution to making our holidays unbelievable. And I don't know what you're thinking as you think about Thanksgiving and Christmas and everything that goes around with, man, the work or family or traveling. I don't know what you think. As I've had conversations with people, uh, it wasn't all great, and that's what the title, it's not all gravy. Anybody thinking about that cinnamon toast crunch gravy? I'm going to try that at home. That was my favorite cereal growing up. And hey, what a great opportunity as you're with your family over the holidays, whether it be Christmas or Thanksgiving, especially if you have middle school or high schoolers, hey, will it gravy? I mean, or gravy, will it, however they, however they said it, and try different things. Middle school or high school, hey, they're not in here right now. Maybe you are, so you don't count. But if you have middle school or high school uh, students in our student environment, hey, that fish gravy, make that the number one. I mean, as you kind of go into the holidays, that'd be fun. But, but we're talking about the holidays. And as I've had conversations, there's a lot of people who are not looking forward to the holidays for many different reasons. So to get us started, because this uh, today is talk, kind of an intro for the next two weeks. I'm going to tell you what the solution and source is to making your holidays unbelievable. And then the next two weeks, I'm going to share two action steps. I'm really excited about uh, week number three as I get to share some of my own personal story and really tell you a story in the Bible that maybe you've never heard before. So don't miss week three. But to start us out, we're going to kind of set this message up. We're going to have a little bit of trivia. So first question is, in, two, in a 2018 study found that what percent of Americans felt stress while celebrating the holidays? So let's kind of just do a poll. How many of, we, of you would just say A? Go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, one or two? Okay. Number two? B? Number two. B? All right. A lot of you. And C? All right, what is the answer? B, 88% of Americans felt stress. So which leads to the next question, what are some or some of the most commonly felt negative emotions during the holidays include fatigue, stress, irritability, sadness, or B, anger, stress, fear, sadness, C, jealousy, fear, stress, sadness. All right, A, few, okay, B, very few. And C, about the same. What was it? Fatigue. Hey, fatigue, stress, irritability. That irritability is my, I mean, just again, I said I needed this message today. As I think about the holidays, I become irritable. I mean, just being transparent with you, all the moving parts, we got four kids, we're all over the map, we're traveling, all those different things. So I become irritable, which again, most common emotions. All right, let's go to the next question. 34% of Americans worry about this uh, or worry that this will disrupt their planned holiday celebrations with friends and family. Tell the person next to you which, what your answer is. A, sickness, B, work obligations, C, lack of money. All right, you good? B, see, I would have totally picked C, lack of money, but they say work obligation, especially, hey, today's, I mean, today's society as people, I mean, people are losing employees right and left. Maybe your workload is going up. Maybe that uh, is uh, what you think will disrupt. All right, last one. What percent of Americans come into conflict with loved ones during the holidays? Ooh. A, 35%, B, 54 C, 69 What would you say? Would you say A? How many would say A? A few, B? All right, C. All right, I think, was it C? Yes, 
And so we wonder why we're so stressful. When we're tired, we're fatigued, we're irritable. 69% of people say that they will have a bad interaction or conflict with someone in their family. It's crazy. As we, as we think about the holidays, that's why we're doing this series. It's like, how do we change our perspective? And that's what today is all about. I'm gonna go ahead and give you uh, what the solution is. And if we want to have a great holiday time with our family, our work, it has nothing to do with what's going on around you. It has nothing to do with the people in front of you. It has nothing to do with the circumstances going on around you. The solution the solution, because as we looked at the poll, that's not good. I mean, we're, we got our work cut out for us because a lot of people are stressed about the holidays. A lot of people are going into the van. They're going to have a conflict with someone in their family for the fifth, eighth, 20th time. So we're stressed. We're tired. And a lot of times the holidays brings out the very worst in us versus the best in us. How do we get the best version of ourselves to go into our holiday experience when it comes to Thanksgiving and Christmas? And today is all about, it has nothing to do, the solution and source of what's gonna make our holidays unbelievable has nothing to do with what's going around us. It has everything to do with something inside of us. And that's where we're going. That's where we're going today. For uh, me and Monica, uh, Monica is my wife. If we don't know each other, she was singing up here on stage. And I remember when we had our first child, Jackson, that was 12 years ago. He's our oldest son. And I can just remember, I mean, like it was yesterday, feeling stressed about the holidays. And I remember us having so many conversations, uh, arguments, I mean, frustrations about the holidays and it had everything to do with traveling. You see, I mean, I come from a divorced family and uh, my family lives in Mobile, so three hours away. My dad lives in Mobile and my mom and stepdad. Uh, my brother lives in Birmingham and that's where Monica's family is. And I can remember as we had our first child being so stressed about traveling. I just wanted to stay home here in Dothan. And some of you may have family in town and you don't have to travel anywhere. And hey, that may be stress for you. But for us, it was very much traveling. And I was just so, because we had to go three hours to Mobile. Then we had to go three hours to Birmingham. Then we had to go over here to grandparents and the other grandparents and all of these things. And I can just remember, I was not looking forward to the holidays. I remember it just like it was yesterday. And that for you, you're like, really? Traveling, that's what stresses you out over the holidays. And you, you may not be, may, you're like, man, you got it easy. A lot of times the thing that stresses us, stresses us out about the holidays, it moves us into apathy. It moves us into frustration or sadness. Maybe you lost someone. Maybe you're tired of dealing with that uncle who is just, man, frustrates you every time y'all have Thanksgiving at their house. Maybe you're frustrated by expectations from in-laws or your parents or parents. You're frustrated because your son-in-law brings out the worst in your daughter. And holidays are so stressful for you and you're not looking forward to it. I don't know what you're thinking about as you go through the holidays, but there's a solution. There's a solution for this holiday time. As you go into Thanksgiving, as you go into Christmas, there is a solution that will bring out the best in you this holiday season. And it will have nothing to do with what's going on around you. I'm not saying those things don't matter. They very much matter. But what we're, where we're going today, what we're talking about is we're going to find as followers of Jesus, what does he, what does Jesus say about us and the things going on around us when it comes to us going through uh, the holidays? He gives in uh, John, uh, which is one of Jesus's closest followers, he uh, writes 
uh, an account of all the time that John spent with Jesus. He, is, he was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was Jesus' closest follower. At the time Jesus died, he uh, put his own mother under the care of John. And so John is writing about what he saw, what he experienced as he walked around with Jesus. And where we're at today is in John chapter 15, and Jesus had just gotten done. He was had his closest followers. He was in Jerusalem the night before he died. The night before he was killed, he met in an upper room. You know this story of the Last Supper and Jesus spending time with his closest followers and he washed their feet and it was time to leave the upper room. And he, they were, he was taking his closest guys uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And as they were walking along the road, John wrote that here was a, a teaching that Jesus, one final teaching that Jesus was going to tell to his closest guys and the women that were following along as well. What did Jesus say? And he gives us a vine metaphor. He gives us a vine metaphor where, and I love what, how Jesus taught his followers. He used metaphors that were very close to them. There was a, a lot of things that Jesus talked about when he taught uh, to his closest followers. It was things, it was everyday things to them. And he used them as examples. And this is where Jesus, Jesus is gonna talk about a vine. And here's a picture of a vineyard, okay? Vineyard, there was vineyards in Israel. They were known, they drank uh, wine when they had meals. And the next one is actually, this is a, a vineyard that has been producing wine for thousands of years in uh, Israel. It's between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. So that's kind of, they knew this very well. And he was going to, I want to get you, you to get one final picture before we read the scripture. This is a picture of a grapevine, okay? And so I want you to get, I'm a visual person, uh, so those of you online, get this picture in your, in your mind as we read what Jesus said to them. In John chapter 15 is where we're at. And Jesus is saying this to his closest followers as they're walking along the road. He said, I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So what Jesus is saying, this is a very familiar metaphor to his closest followers. Not only was there vineyards and hey, they know the process of grape growing and cutting off the branches to grow more fruit, but Jesus was some, saying something deeper because as Israelites or as ch the children of Israel, these guys and women, they knew very well that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was known as the vine. And it wasn't a good thing because when they talked about the vine, it had negative consequences because Israel was always disobeying what God told them to do. And so what Jesus was doing is he was turning that upside down to where he said, yeah, you know, Israel is known as the vine and it could never live up to what God wanted for them. They, they never could obey what he was commanding them to do. But I'm gonna come and change that. I'm gonna turn that upside down because I, I am the true vine. This is one of the I am statements. There were seven statements that Jesus said, I am something. This was the last one that he gave. This was who he was. It's not about what Jesus was gonna do for them. It was about who he was. And as followers of Jesus, we rest in who he is. Because otherwise, if he is not who he is, then what he accomplished on our behalf doesn't matter. So we wholeheartedly 
We wholeheartedly believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that he will always do what he promises to do. That's the songs that we sang a while ago. He is good. We believe that as followers of Jesus. And so Jesus was saying, I am the true vine. I know Israel could not live up to my father's commands, but I, I am different. As I remain in my Father, I am the true vine. Because if you are familiar, I am not a gardener. I am not, I don't grow anything. It is not in my expertise. I mean, I don't know anything about growing things. But if you're familiar with planting things or gardening, you know, you know that when it comes to the vine, that is where the branches get. Is, he is the source. That's what he is saying. He is the source to everything in life. And sometimes he has to prune it. If you're, what he was saying, if you're not growing things, I'm gonna cut it off. You know that as you are familiar with growing things. And sometimes they have to be cut off. They fall and the, uh, vine, the vineyard or vine dresser, he comes up, takes it and he throws it into the fire. You'll see that in a moment. But what Jesus was saying He was saying, remain in me and you will bear much fruit. You will bear much fruit. Well, fruit, what what do you mean? Like grapes? Like, no, if you kind of read in Galatians where Paul is saying, the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, faithfulness. That is the fruit as you remain in Jesus. That is what is gonna grow. And sometimes we have to be pruned, right? We have to be pruned. It starts with me. Like I, as I said earlier, I need this message more probably than anyone because I can be irritable. I can be irritable with my kids. I can be uh, not, I can be harsh with my spouse. And that is what Jesus is saying is when you remain in me, this is what, He grows in you because it's inside. It's inside. We can't control the external service. You going into the holidays, you can't control that diagnosis that you just got. You can't control what your uncle is doing every time or how he communicates with you and your kids and your mom and dad as you go to his house every Thanksgiving. You can't control those things. But what Jesus is saying is you very well can control not, you can't control that. But as you remain in me, I will produce fruit in you that will change your life forever. I've never heard anybody say, man, I just don't want you to be patient anymore. I don't want you to be gentle anymore. I want you to be harsh. Your kid is not coming to you and say, dad, will you just quit loving me? Will you quit being joyful? No. He never says that. That is what Jesus produces in you as you remain in him. Let's go on as it goes, as the passage goes on. It says, if anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I love that verse. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit. You glorify God when you bear much fruit, but you do not bear much fruit when you don't remain in him. You don't produce those things. You can't produce joy in your life. You can't produce more patience in your life. You can't. And we find that out all the time when we live for ourselves, when we get frustrated uh, by being overwhelmed at work, it pours into your home life and you're not kind with your spouse. You have no self-control because you're frustrated. When you live for yourself, you don't produce those things. And that's what Jesus was saying. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. As a follower of Jesus, that is what you are here to do. Through him, 
that he produce fruit. And as he says, that is to show other people that you are a disciple, you are a follower of Jesus. Goes on, as my father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's what he was, that's what he wants to give you. He want, as you remain in him, he wants to give you his joy. Imagine what that would look like. Joy instead of sorrow. You just lost someone that you love. You don't have joy in that. But he, you have his joy because his joy gives you the capacity to go through that and not let it overtake your life. He wants to give you his peace. He wants to give you his love, his gentleness, his kindness. Think about your marriage right now. How many of us I need to be more kind to my spouse. Just get frustrated because I'm frustrated at work. And I try to do better. Man, I'm so sorry. But it keeps happening as a result of not remaining in Jesus. And that is what today is all about. As you go into the holidays, As you go into the holidays, imagine what your holidays would be like. Imagine what your family gatherings would be like. Imagine what your workplace would be like. Imagine what your dinners with friends would be like if you had more joy, if you had more patience, if you had more gentleness, if you had more self control, your holidays would be completely different. As I said earlier, I mean, usually during the holidays, I'm pretty, it's it's stressful, irritable. What I see in this verse is it starts with me. I'm not talking about you. I'm saying I have got to remain in Jesus. And he's gonna prune some things. What needs to be cut out of my life? That's what the metaphor is saying. What needs to be cut out of my life so I can be more patient with my kids? So I can be more gentle with my kids? So I can be more kind to my wife? So I can have more self-control? So I can be more gentle with my mom at get-togethers. It starts with me. And when I don't remain in Jesus, that's where the stress comes in. That's where the fatigue comes in. That's where the sadness comes in. That's where the irritability comes in. So what does it look like for you? Imagine what your holidays would look like if you remain in Jesus. You may be here, you may not be a follower of Jesus. You may, I don't know if I believe that. I just came with my friend. They invited me. I want to kind of check it out, but I just don't, I don't, I don't do that stuff, do the whole Jesus thing. It's an invitation because he wants this for you. It's not about, as you think about, well, hey, are you, what does remaining in Jesus look like? Well, it means spending time with him as you are connected to the vine. What does it look like for you to spend time with Jesus? Communicating with him. That's what prayer is. As you evaluate, let's just say this past weekend, how much time did you spend with Jesus remaining in him? And it's not a guilt thing. It's not Jesus isn't saying, well, you didn't spend time with me. You didn't get up at 5 a.m. in the morning to just sit there and talk to me. He's not saying that. 
as you remain in Jesus, it's illuminating what he wants for you. He wants you to bear fruit for yourself because he knows what will happen in your life when you remain in him and he produces the fruit that you can't produce for yourself. He knows what will happen. It will change your life forever. It will change your Thanksgiving dinner with your family. It will change your conversations with your kids. It will change your daily time with your wife or your husband as he produces these things. And yeah, it's gonna mean pruning. It's gonna mean cutting things out of your life that you don't need so you can produce more fruit. That is what he wants for you, not from you. He wants that for you. So imagine, imagine what your holidays would be like if you remain in Jesus and surrender every part of your life to him. Over the next couple of weeks, I wanna give you uh, this verse. I want us to commit it to memory together to remind us what can happen as we remain in him. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Paul writes, he says, rejoice always. Rejoice, rejoice in that family gathering where my uncle is always cursing at family members, not rejoice in the external circumstance. How, how do you rejoice when you lost someone you love? How do you rejoice when you get a, a bad diagnosis? You don't rejoice in the circumstance, you rejoice because you are connected to the source of life and that is Jesus because he gives us the capacity to be joyful in the midst of sorrow. He gives us the capacity to be kind instead of being harsh or irritable. He gives us the capacity and he grows in us the ability to have self-control when it's hard to do so. Rejoicing in him as you are connected to him. That's what Paul was saying, rejoice always. He says, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is what God's will is for your life, is to remain in Jesus and the outcome is for him to produce fruit in your life, which gives God glory. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for you this holiday season is for you to remain in him. And I want us to just remember that verse. When we find ourselves irritable with our spouse, go back to this verse. Rejoice always. Pray continually. You're connecting with Jesus. Time with him. And the outcome is him producing fruit in your life. I love what uh, my wife, Monica, she shared this on Instagram it's a guy, his name is E.J. Gaines. He said, every one of my little freak outs, every one of my little freak outs is a reminder that I have looked even for just a moment away from Jesus. We'll read that again. Every one of my little freak outs is a reminder that I have looked even if just for a moment away from Jesus. Jesus. Think about your holidays. Think about how you communicate. Think about what you're going through. How are you going to remain in Jesus? Will you remain in Jesus? For those of you who are not followers of Jesus, the invitation is for you to place your trust in him and remain in him. And watch how he changes your life forever. So will you remain in Jesus? The next two weeks are two practical steps, things that you can do this holiday season as you remain in Jesus. He is the source and solution to this holiday season being the best that it's ever been in our lives if we remain in him. Love to pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you for being our source, our solution to all of the things that life throws our way, God. 
We so often try to do it on our own and we can't. We can't, Father. You are the only one that can produce the fruit we need that will change our lives forever. God, grow fruit in us as we remain in you. And God, cut away, cut away, prune back all the things that are unnecessary that you see as we surrender to you and give everything in our lives to you. Will you do that? And we will trust you. We will trust you as we spend time with you. God, we love you so much. And it's in your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys so much for being here today. We'd love to see you next week as we continue this series. Again, if you want any information about Lighthouse, Powell's gonna be down front here. If you want any information about Africa, I'll be down front over here. And would love for you to take a card to make a difference. Uh, let's unload uh, generosity and love on Beverly, Beverly's teachers. You guys have a great afternoon.